Welcome, dear readers. You are listening to Time to Read, a Winnipeg Public Library podcast. We are recording in the epic Carol Shields Auditorium in the wonderful Millennium Library here in Treaty 1 Territory, and on the land that is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Today we will be discussing Fun Home by Alison Bechdel. I'm Alan Chorney, the branch head librarian at Transcona Library, and across the table from me is... Hi, I'm Trevor. I'm the part-time funeral director at the uh, Louis Rail Library, and across the table from me is... Hi, I'm Erica Ball. I'm the librarian at Fort Gary Library, and over there is... Hi, I'm Kirsten, and I'm the librarian over at West End Library slash Funeral Home. <laughs> A good book can carry me away from an ever-engine Of course, we can do this without you, dear readers. It's your questions and comments that get us started, so email us at wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca. Remember, only you can determine whether we laugh or cry. There will be spoilers, so each month, be sure to find Time to Read the selected book so you can find Time to Read on iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast service. We want to talk about what you want to talk about, so send your thoughts and comments anytime to wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca or find us on social media so we can incorporate your thoughts onto the air. Make sure you stick around to the end for our special segment, Nerd Words for Word Nerds. But first, Kirsten is going to give us a brief bio that highlights the career of Alison Bechdel, followed by Erica, who will spoil everything with a brief synopsis. So if you haven't read Fun Home and would like us to wait, please press pause now. Kirsten, over to you. Doing a biography about an author who just wrote her memoir, like, <laughs> yeah, so I'm just trying to fill in some of the uh, some of the, the gaps here. So Alison Bechdel was born 1960. She grew up in Beach Creek, Pennsylvania, population. 800. I didn't realize it was such a small small. town, actually. She worked as a word processor, food bank, warehouse employee, and writer. Well known for her long-running comic strip, Dykes to Watch Out For, her first cartoons were drawn in the margins of letters she wrote to friends. Those friends then suggested she start her own comic strip, which she did in 1983. In a 1985 strip from Dykes to Watch Out For called The Rule, she introduced what is now known as the Bechdel Test, a method for evaluating the portrayal of women in fiction, and we will discuss further later on in the podcast. In addition to the memoir Fun Home, she also, in 2012, wrote a second memoir called Are You My Mother? A Comic Drama as a companion piece, and this one focused on her relationship with her mother, which I was happy to hear about, actually, because I was quite interested in, in her mother in this book, actually. She's very interested with various fitness and exercise fads, which she has chronicled in a third memoir that was supposed to be published in 2017, but it looks like it hasn't been published yet. Anyway, she explores both the history of fitness fads and how she herself uses exercise as a way to rekindle creativity. The book is called The Secret to Superhuman Strength and was supposed to be published, like I said, in November of 2017. And I haven't been able to find it anywhere. So maybe that's just something we can look forward to. She is the 2014 winner of a MacArthur Genius Grant. In April 2017, she was appointed as Vermont's third cartoonist laureate. And she sits, invited in 2006, on the usage panel of the American Heritage Dictionary. Ooh which is super interesting. Mm -hmm. I had never heard of that before. So I guess they have a group of nearly 200 prominent scholars and writers and journalists who sit on this usage. We could talk about that later too. Hmm. Alison Bechtel. So there's lots that weren't, wasn't in this memoir. <laughs> yeah. I'm waiting for the third one. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Fun Home is a graphic memoir of the author's complex relationship with her father. I have kind of con- con- complex underlined and like complex doesn't even begin Starred. to describe it <laughs> just after her father's unexpected death in a possible suicide their relationship was close in some ways but they also kept secrets in both cases of hidden homosexuality as well as on his part other illicit and illegal behavior though chronicling episodes in Bechdel's childhood in rural Pennsylvania Fun Home also addresses themes of sexual orientation, gender roles, suicide, emotional abuse, dysfunctional family life, 
appearance versus reality, the role of literature in understanding oneself, and the layers of truth in memories and mementos, which is really quite a lot for such a slim volume. <laughs> Hence the name Fun Home. <laughs> Hence the name Fun Home. Yeah. So I have a funny story about the title Fun Home. Okay. Um, well, maybe not. Yeah, it's kind of a funny story. Uh, anyways, I, I had read this book years ago uh, during my undergrad and I was reading it again, and then my partner was recommended this book, so she was also reading it, and she was a little bit ahead of me reading it the second time, and she's like, Fun Home, is that like because of the funeral parlor aspect? <laughs> and I was like, no, no, <laughs> not at all. This book is about so much more that that's not what the title's about. And then she was like, a few weeks later, she's like, yes, it is. That's what the title's about. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I had the same sort of thing. I was reading it, and I'm like, oh, because it's like tongue-in-cheek. Oh, what a fun home. Yeah. And then I get yeah. to the part where their funeral home and I'm like yeah. oh <laughs> now I get it yeah yeah and I, I first read it when I heard it was being turned into a Broadway musical I wanted to read the the, the graphic novel and and again yeah it's anything but a fun home <laughs> yeah, I thought right. this story could be called trigger warning <laughs> but uh, right. yeah, you know, with all this content um, so many triggers mm -hmm. Some so, of the most moving panels, I thought, just about that, some of the most moving panels were about the ones where they were in the same room, but facing away from each other or in the gardens, like they seemingly partaking in this calm, peaceful life, but there's this space between them. And I just found those panels so heartbreaking. I'm struck by how not fun at all, even in the like, few moments where it seems like there should be levity in their lives. Like, I don't think there is a panel where anyone looks like they're happy in this book ever which just made it makes me feel like really really sad for the family and i like i hope there's more joy in their lives than yeah. what i got from this book yeah but i think that speaks to when somebody is denying who they are or when somebody is just so miserable it's impossible like even when you're oh you share a laugh or whatever that doesn't change the fact that you're miserable and your family is miserable because you're miserable and it just there is no break in that when somebody like her father is going through what he's going through his whole life, apparently. Yeah. yeah. And as, as I read it too, I, I was wondering about, you know, how much of this was Alison Bechdel's way of working through her feelings and how much of it was a therapeutic and how much can we actually rely on her as telling a factual memoir. I mean, we can talk about that a bit more too. Where, uh, you know, sometimes if you were make a journal entry about something and if someone else read it, it would be like, oh my God, yeah. you know, uh, this person is having dark, terrible thoughts. But in fact, it could also just be a way of working through the bad stuff yeah, to, you to, might be to be venting, well. Right? And just, I wonder yeah. if this is just a very public uh, <laughs> journal and a journal that we've all been allowed to read because she's let us read it too. I'm just throwing that out there. It's an idea. So I, I read that she had taken hundreds of photographs of herself as the various members of her family, mm -hmm. including her father lying in a coffin and dressed as her father. So it's almost like she tried to kind of put herself into every member of her family mm -hmm. as she was telling this story. And yet mm -hmm. it still is her story because it's her. Right. Because it's, it's always going to be people. her interpretation exactly. of the events. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in a way that makes it maybe <clears throat> makes it more honest than somebody writing a biography or something and having the actual pictures, because at least she's saying this is all coming through me. Right. Like mm. she's making it more explicit. But yeah. then she also says in the book, in her journal keeping career, she has doubted her own interpretation. Right of, from a young age. From a really What young was it age. that she said? I think. I think. I think. I think this happened. I, I think, think this person Just in small this. writing, you should write something up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I thought that was yeah. very sort of insightful of herself as a young child to even be thinking about that too. That yeah. this is how I am living through this. This is how I am remembering it. It could be not entirely true. Which which all memoirists should point out. Yeah, you but know? there she was thinking yeah. it yeah. at yeah. 10 or whatever. Yeah, I mean, she was yeah. a pretty amazing. A pretty amazing, apparently. Child. Yeah. 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 When I write journals, which I have done off and on throughout my life, I have this weird thing where I trust my journal more as like a, as a snapshot of what my mind frame was like. And I wonder if that goes into how I write the journal, which I think might be contrasted 
to how Bechdel writes the journal, where I'm like, I feel really bad if I attempt to embellish anything when I write it down. I, I strive for a certain amount of accuracy when I write hmm. things so that when I do go look back, I can I can hopefully readjust my brain to get in that snapshot of, of that that time in my life. Well, and you're a bit of a you're a writer. Like you do, you've written creative uh, short yeah. stories and, and I've kept journals as well, but not as a writer. Like I've kept journals just for myself to work through things. And so I actually don't ever, or often I'm not all that into reading back on those entries because I just think, oh, I was such a sad, sad teenager. <laughs> well, you're focusing on that sad part when you're Absolutely. writing, right? Like that's the part that you need to get out. And it's then I would say to myself, stuff. write about the happy stuff. And then I just couldn't, you know, yeah, no boring. time for that. Yeah, but, no, so I, I approached yeah. it differently because I think because you are a writer, perhaps you wanted to make sure that you were also writing. Yeah, it well, I guess I have well. this thing about it where it's like, if you're, I have a really hard time of writing something that isn't meant to be read. And I understand that right. a lot of people People do things therapeutically, you know, to just ha never have it be re read again. But yeah. I'm always like, in my mind somewhere, someone's going to be go digging through my stuff and oh, find I, it. I totally get that. Yeah. Like once it's down in writing in a notebook, like yeah. who knows who could find it? That, like five that years makes me now. very, very nervous, actually, because I have thought of that before. Have I talked about how sometimes I worry that like I'll die in the night and I live no. alone and then no one will find me or it'll be a long time. Anyway, wow. I don't have a cat oh, either. So dark. anyway, this is um, from dark. Is this I know, the sorry. darkest fun home? No, no. Unfun home. I think this is going to be a very dark uh, podcast. So my, you know, my big worry is though, is that people will then go through my stuff and they'll find all those journals. <laughs> and they'll find out that you're, 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 a, you're a horrible person. And they'll find, the yeah, inside. that, yeah. But you aren't <laughs> really, you're an excellent person. Yeah, and by, sure but if they're fine. only basing it on what you've on written, the journals They'll exactly like, oh, right dear lord but, but you've written years ago so just lately i've been thinking i gotta get rid of those journals <laughs> or you can just write a whole bunch of like uh, uh sham journals <laughs> and hide those around right. uh, and throw and, them and, off the scent yeah, what's yeah, real yeah exactly they'll find this one they're like oh there's nothing in here except she's writing about what the weather was like and then she had you know you know chili for supper who wants to read this so there's those that not turn to the next page which is all then code which okay, code. alice and bechtel also then right. eventually started she, to use as well in chili her is not actually chili <laughs> I mean, yeah. they made something <laughs> spicier, perhaps. <laughs> Well, did Samuel Pepys do that as well? Remember, he was the famous journalist. I don't mean journalist as in writing newspapers, mm -hmm. but a guy that writes journals mm -hmm. in, in like the 1600s. And and his journal is like a, is a, there's a complete set of it. But he was always writing in code because he, he was having tons of affairs. Oh. And, he, and his, he didn't want his wife to find out. So, but but it gives you an excellent snapshot in, into what say like England was like in the 1600s. And, oh, yeah. and but, but it's all crazy. Like you know, like you're not sure what's going on because he. It's in code. It's in code, but it's, it's fascinating. Awesome. And yeah, there's a Twitter account that retweets Samuel Pepys' uh, diary, which, <laughs> I, which I follow. Yeah, of it's true. Of course you do. Yeah. And, and, and it's pretty great because there's random snippets of weirdness. Anyway, Samuel Pepys, everybody. That's so great. Yeah. But yeah, but that's like a, a, a recurring theme in Fun Home as well is, is the code, not only in her own journal, but even going out into literature, you know, talking about the hidden aspects of homosexuality and the importance of being earnest. Uh, she talks about that a lot. Mm. And they talk about the sun also rises being a Romane clef, you know, so Ernest Hemingway was basically writing about himself and his friends in, in that book as well. Oh, because yeah, can, can we just, can we just, yeah, can we just take a moment for the like incredible amount of layered allusions and to allegories oh and gosh. and yeah and c comparisons from her life and like in this in the same page it'd be mm. like three or four yeah it just blew my mind <laughs> well and now i'm thinking that i didn't even think about this until right now but because of the codes being a theme i didn't even there's there's so much here just on the surface i didn't even really think as to what might be a code in this yeah. book yeah, when she mm -hmm. compares her father to Daedalus and then her father to Odysseus or whoever it was, like she's constantly switching up yeah. what she's trying to say about him. Yeah, she's working through it on the page and different, uh, she's kind of picking and but choosing. But tangentially yeah, to yeah. other bits of literature or, or specific parts. Yeah, this is definitely, I think also, I think I will reread this mm -hmm. just because there were so many layers. And I, I think it's a good example of a graphic novel for those people that are like, 
well, I don't, I don't read comics. Oh yeah. You know, right. and, um, and this is a good moment to just sort of remind everybody that, uh, the comics is a, a format. It's not a genre. <laughs> it's a format. <laughs> and graphic, graphic memoir means it's in the, in that format. Not necessarily it's that it's super graphic or anything right, in its content. Right, right. right. Um, there's a little bit of graphic here. Yeah. I don't, I don't read graphic novels really. I am so used to my eye just going across mm-hmm. the page in these, in horizontal lines that I find it sometimes takes a lot of effort to focus on a graphic novel the way the way that you're supposed to read with the pictures and the words at the same time. I think maybe this is the third or fourth graphic novel I've read, including a children's book about sloths called Ernesto and somebody where the <laughs> one sloth goes on an adventure and the other one is very anxious about it. But I think the only other thing that I wanted to go back to was where, when we were talking about going back to journal entries. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to ask, because it occurs to me, like what she's doing is however many years after the event, going back to journal entries and and then creating a new thing out of it. Right. So that's a whole other layer of, it's almost turning them into se- secondary sources where, yeah, interpreting. where even though it's her life, like I think it's been decades, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't remember accurately, even after reading journal entries, uh, certain things about my, my childhood, you know, even mm-hmm. big events. I was reading a book about memory and how we remember things. And the interesting thing is, I guess the neuro- neuroscientists have discovered that like every time you recall a memory, you're recreating that memory so it's like you call it up and your old memory disappears and you make a new memory of that memory that you Mm. called up so in that sense your memory can change over time i feel that validates like all of (laughs) my memories and the stories associated with my memories you're not you're not not remembering the event itself you're remembering the last time you remember that's right yeah and that was remembering the last time before that and that so it's like you get a telephone so on and so on it can gradually change okay well that totally reminds me of like for the last 20 years, people have been saying that when people think of the Titanic disaster, they don't look at historical photos. They think of the James Cameron movie. Yeah. <laughs> because that is the that's, reality. That's like that, a societal that, that, reimagining. So we, yeah, of, so when you hear the word Titanic, you don't necessarily think of black and white photos or like, you know, the books that were written. A, a, a Night to Remember or whatever those original books are called. You think, you think of, of how Rose your heart and will go Jack on. And your heart will go on. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, Alan. And, uh, Can we just point out there's plenty of room on that door for Jack. Yeah, like, that, there really would, was. Like the, maybe, the myth, maybe, maybe would have tipped over. I don't know, but you know. MythBusters proved uh, that there was enough room for Jack. <laughs> <laughs> they recreated. That's it. always Ro- Rose was just all like kind of spread out there. She was just like She's like a boomerang or something. Door. She was just you know. <laughs> Uh, it was very moving. Poor Jack. Us. I didn't like that part when he froze at the end. Spoiler alert. <laughs> didn't like that part. <laughs> Spoiler alert. At the end of Titanic. <laughs> Titanic and sadly. <laughs> Spoiler. <laughs> hey everyone, it's Trevor here. Are you concerned that your children are outside in the fresh air too much? Playing with friends, eating ice cream, maybe even swimming? Why not bring them by your local library this summer and sign them up for the TD Summer Reading Club? It's totally free, and you get an activity booklet, stickers, bookmarks, and a calendar where you color in each day that they read or are read to. For every five days that they read, they'll get a ballot for a chance to win prizes. And while you're here, why not check out some video games and DVDs? Get those kids as much screen time as you can. I hear the radiation is an excellent source of vitamin D. Fresh air? Who needs it? Editor's Note. Medical and health claims in the preceding announcement have not been evaluated by Health Canada and should probably be ignored. Winnipeg Public Library thinks that reading and outdoor activities should both be part of a healthy and fun life. You can even combine them by reading outside. The other thing I was thinking about in terms of like journals and remembering events from your past, I'm old enough that when I would go on big trips when I was younger, I would write home letters or um, I would get and then I would also get letters and I have both of those sets. Then that kind of creates some added memory and information for my memories because I have that other person who's also involved. Let me in... just stop you there for a second. So you have both sets. So how do you have the letters <laughs> yeah. that you sent? Well, cause I would send them to my mom oh, and then, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, okay. yeah. I don't have like letters that I sent to you, like a friend, I but my were, sister, I thought you were going to make like photocopies of them before you went or something. Just <laughs> At the bottom, just... She says, give these back to me the yeah. next time you see right. them. No, carry on, carry on. No, me. like then she includes it for uh, me, like my self <laughs> stamp envelope <laughs> with every letter she sent. You can Hi, keep Kirsten. this for one week. I expect it back. 
<laughs> for my archive. That's right. And and usually it was when I was on trip. So this was back in the day too, when you would go to like the major post office in like Rome and just have something written post recent and you know, you get your letters from there. Did I say that at the last podcast? I might have. Anyway. I um, so. le- I'm supposed to be the one with a bad memory right now. <laughs> <laughs> I have a terrible memory. But it it's interesting talking about the chains of letters because you can there's there's books of famous peoples of of their correspondence which are always interesting to I read. I do like books with letters. Mm. Yeah. But the crazy thing now is with email you basically have that correspondence in a way because your your emails you keep all your sent messages unless you go and delete them and mm. and I know I have email threads of, with correspondences of exes and family members and all that sort of mm. stuff that you just have forever now and yeah, both sides right and yeah what and they both wrote, what, what you wrote back. and you what you wrote back yeah yeah pictures and, you might have attached or links you might have included speaking of letters it makes me think of the opposite of that where you only have one set of letters and uh, there's a book one of the anna green gables books i think it's called anne of windy poplars mm-hmm. and, and it's it's the first like i'd say three quarters of the book is just her this is before she uh, is married to Gilbert, spoilers, uh, <laughs> and, and she's just working as a school teacher, and she's writing letters to him because they're apart. But the weird thing is, is you only see her letters, so you get the impression that he's just not writing her back, <laughs> and she's stalking him. Uh, uh, you know, like, it's just like letter after letter, she's telling what's going on in this thing. I'm like, man, like, leave the guy alone. He's obviously not interested, you know, and then, you know, so anyway, just throwing that out there. Anna wouldn't be popular. I, I do like how you've just brought Anne of Green Gables into the discussion of <laughs> Fun home by <laughs> Alison Bechtel. Who would have thought that would come all, up? <laughs> One thing that just in the, in terms of like the email and electronic records and stuff is I have when my phone gets full. I have a hard time deleting old messages um, <laughs> to people, mainly the ones with my husband, because there's so much in there about our daughter's early years. Uh. There's pictures that we sent. Look, look at this crazy thing she's doing right now kind of thing that I know the pictures are, are going to be somewhere, but I feel like there's so much context. Yeah. And then it'll be things like who was supposed to get the milk or, you know, like asking the other person to do this, like really kind of mundane thing that I feel like maybe like decades from now that would be a nice record to keep but you can't keep it all right yeah. no you can i've done it when i got rid of my old <laughs> flip phone i literally hand tra- well not hand transcribed but i got my phone out and the text message history and i sat in front of my computer oh. and i <laughs> retyped all those text oh. messages wow. some wow. of them are really worth keeping you know it's like i feel like i've just lost a whole bunch of really valuable did that just blow your mind <laughs> You shouldn't feel bad. It's a. It's more of a problem than a good idea. I promise. I've got like you. major storage um, problems on really? my phone. But yeah. you can, you know, especially if you have an iPhone, there are apps you can go out yeah. uh, and get that will. But then you'll just extract. you'll have these like huge amount of data. Yeah, and no, it's, most of it will not be worth keeping. Yes, and you won't be able to find the stuff that is worth <laughs> yeah. keeping. So that's how I also feel about my pictures. Like there's just thousands of too pictures. much. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like growing up, like I. Had had like one photo album yeah. of me when I was from a baby to like say I don't know like I was like 10 and I looked at that photo album dozens and dozens of times and it was just one photo album yeah and, my, and there was one for my brother and now there's like something like 6,000 photos of our daughter <laughs> and none of them are in an album and I mean there, there is some in an album but it's just such a my, weird I'm not in an album. Yeah. And you probably haven't related like any of those photos to you know like Virginia Woolf you know no, or, or, or the no. Great Gatsby or something no. like that made some sort of because there's just too many yeah. you can't focus on any one of them too much. Yeah. That, that was one of the questions we asked on social media correct about um yeah the difference of not having printed pictures anymore and like i miss that like i took a lot of pictures on film and i'd have and so i just have boxes and boxes of everyday life pictures and since like iphone and stuff like that i have no physical pictures because it's actually more work it's actually more work to go and do i took a photography course a few years ago and one of the things they recommended that you do if you're into taking pictures is to actually go out and print them because it's such a different feeling and you get a different perspective yeah. of of a picture when you you know take the effort to go and print it out and, and then make it just that a little bit bigger mm-hmm. and so then you can see maybe more things in it more details and yeah it's not just like the face it's, and then you could put it somewhere where you see it 
accidentally all the time yeah. instead of being all like, I'm going to go then to my pictures. You on have my a phone. memory, and then, but then, of course, you're creating a new memory <laughs> of that memory. So, yeah. But I, I wonder if, like, we're all of a generation where we think of photos as, as something different because we do remember when it was something special to yeah. get it printed out, whereas mm-hmm. as now they seem definitely way more disposable. Uh, than they used to be. But I mean, that's why lots of people are, you know, have the Polaroids, right? And they're taking those Polaroid Polaroids, pictures, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's, there's some of that kind of coming yeah. back. Or, right. Yeah. But back when we only had film, people weren't taking pictures of their supper. No. And, <laughs> no. Uh, in restaurants. Right. But as as someone who who grew up with the rarity of photos, like, even if I take a picture of a meal, and I don't do that very often, <laughs> but like those random pictures to, you know, send somebody look what I saw on the street today or, or whatever I ha- I still have a hard time deleting it off my mm-hmm. phone I mean obviously as I was talking about I have a hard time deleting <laughs> I think things this is in a general. different issue yeah but <laughs> you no, but have a hard it time becomes a record of, of something that you might not, not otherwise remember and yeah I think one of the things is why I'm a, I, I would say collector and not hoarder um, <laughs> but getting rid of things I think is difficult for me because I'm worried that I won't have that item to trigger the memory and then I will never have that memory again. Yeah, I have have a terrible memory and I need objects to recall it and then I'll I'll recall it in like crazy detail all of a sudden but I would have had no reason to without the object. I think John Hodgman says the difference between a hoarder and a collector is if you have a display case. Oh, is that the only... Okay, (laughs) I'll just get a display case. I walked (laughs) through the Ikea a few weeks ago and I saw display cases and I was like like drooling. (laughs) I was like, I want... I want one of those. There, collector. (laughs) Collector, but for the fun. Your question earlier, Trevor, about like, do we believe her memory? Yeah. Do do, we? Well, do we, I believe that she believes in them. (laughs) She's weirdly honest about it in the book in terms of like, I don't know, this could have happened or this couldn't have happened, Mm -hmm. especially Mm -hmm. in terms of his suicide. Mm -hmm. She's like, did he commit suicide? Did he not? And that's, Mm -hmm. that's a very ambiguous question. Yeah, I mean, she sometimes makes you kind of think about how factually true could be when it's line drawings and memories based on memories. But then you realize that's the same for any memoir or autobiography. Yeah. Oh, yeah, like you sure, just yeah. have to either buy it or you don't buy it or you buy parts or you just say, well, this is your interpretation of the event. And maybe your mother would remember it completely differently. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. That's why I'm glad to have those letters from my mother. <laughs> so, you yes, know, in response to then, my letter. But then you could yeah. also get into the thing of what somebody is willing to put down on paper. To their what mother. What somebody is willing yeah. to say to their daughter. Right, right. Like, there's like my, all these, like my like, idea of having a decoy journal. Maybe, yes. <laughs> maybe nothing is real. And it, it, it's interesting. <laughs> Kirsten's touching her head a little bit. <laughs> Because of who gets to put the record down. Because when when we look at Fun Home, this is the this is pretty much the only perspective we're going to get of that story. Like we'll never see her father's perspective, mm-hmm. uh, probably not even her mother's perspective. And the interesting thing that I found is I was actually perusing the Wikipedia entry for this and going through it, and they quote this book as saying that the father committed suicide. When it's definitely more ambiguous yeah, in the book in the than book. that, but yeah. in the Wikipedia article. They say it's by suicide, and the reference that they give is the book for Mm. saying that that happened, which I thought was a really... Yeah, I wouldn't interpret that either. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to slide in here in the interest of not plagiarizing. Part of my summary was from the Wikipedia entry, (laughs) so some of the wording in there will match the Wikipedia entry. I just should have noted that before. Don't worry, I got your back, Erica. I've already gone in and edited the Wikipedia (laughs) page, (laughs) so it doesn't match anymore. (laughs) Or you could cite my summary in the Wikipedia page. (laughs) There you go. Thank you. Yeah, Um, but what 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 was your question again about that? Yeah, just about how you get these records uh, from a certain perspective and that kind of becomes canon, which I think I also wanted to tie to the Bechdel test because Mm -hmm. it's the Bechdel test. But if you look into the history of the comic, she presents the title card of the rule is with thanks to Liz Wallace. And it's actually Liz Wallace who came up with the rule even oh, yeah. though we call it the Bechdel test. So it's the well, and then, test. and then Bechdel said that she's pretty sure that Wallace got it from Virginia Woolf from a room of oh, your, it all of comes your back own. To Virginia own because Wolf. there was a whole like quote where Virginia Woolf actually talks about 
going look, thinking back about fiction and two female characters and who do they talk about and do yeah. they are there ever two female characters who have names and so it actually maybe. actually oh, comes by comes but back maybe back. we should actually maybe describe they, what the right Bechdel we've been talking about is. the Bechdel yeah. test uh, it's um, you let, you guys let me know whether I have this right I've heard it referred to as the Bechdel Wallace test yeah. which oh. covers both of them off yeah. it's a litmus test to determine the very basic level of a uh, woman's autonomy in works of fiction by examining whether female characters have even a single conversation about something that is not a male character. So there are three components. There has to be at least two female characters who have at least one conversation about something other than a male character. And later amendments to this uh, rule or test is that the female characters have to be named yeah. in, the, uh, in the work of uh, mm-hmm. uh, fiction. And before we go on about the Bechdel test. Did you know that there's a couple of other feminist fiction tests out there? There's one called the the Mako Mori test, which is taken from the movie Pacific Rim, where it's a very male-dominated story, but there's one female character called Mako Mori. And so the Mako Mori test is if uh, there's at least one female character who gets her own narrative arc that is not about supporting a man's story. Hmm. So that's kind of interesting, I, like I thought. And there's a few more, three or four. I don't go into it before because we're mostly yeah, talking there, about the Isn't Bechdel. there one at the, that's about if you could replace the female character with a lamp? That's called and the, if the, that's and called if the, the sexy story, lamp. The sexy lamp. And yes. if the story <laughs> still actually proceeds, then it fails. Like, yeah. it yeah, fails it the, the test. The, 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 yeah. her, she, her being there is just to be a, exactly. a, a pretty thing yeah. and not, yeah. not uh, plot-driven yeah. at all. Exactly. And then there's something called the Ellen Willis test, which determines whether a work uh, a work's depiction of at least two related characters would work if the genders of the characters were switched. Mm. So that's something else that you could do and see whether it's... Imp- Equality. Yeah. yeah. And, um, so, but back to the Bechdel test. I don't know. Did you guys... Did, just a, an example of it in action. I found this article uh, in The New Yorker. And what they did was they looked at the Oscar nominations for Best Picture this year, <laughs> and they did the Bechdel test on them, and they compared them with other like movies. Mm-hmm. And so, for example, are you guys wanting to hear a couple yeah, of yeah, these? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Yep. So the, I, did, I didn't read the article. Okay. I didn't so. read it either. Okay, great. So, so, I did read the article, so I know all the answers. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So, uh, so, so <laughs> Alan's going to sound yeah. super smart. I'll judge. <laughs> okay, so um, between the movies Lady Bird... Mm-hmm. Or the Grand Budapest Hotel. Uh, which one do you think passes the Bechdel test? Right. Do we, I guess we should have seen these movies. Lady I mean, Bird. I saw I, Lady Bird. I, I saw Lady I, Bird. Yeah, Grand they, Budapest. They, they, that would pass. Yeah, yeah, they have lots of conversations that are interesting. So I got this one wrong because I was like, this must be a red herring. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> right. You double bluffed yourself. So in, this, yeah. so in this one, the answer is Lady Bird. Yeah. It says, this film, Greta uh, Gerwig's directorial debut, passes the test from the very first scene in which Lady Bird, uh, played by Shirsi Ronan, I didn't think I was going to say that word out loud, name out loud, and her mother... <laughs> A Marion, played by Laurie Metcalf, are on a road trip to visit uh, colleges. Lady Bird says that she only wants to go to school in places where there is culture, like New York. So they have a conversation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, about, <laughs> I don't even remember was, male yeah. characters in that movie, actually. No, um, just, yeah, how about have you, The Shape of Water mm-hmm. or Avatar? Oh, The Shape of Water, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to say Shape yeah. of Water as well. Because yeah. there are two characters. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I said yes too soon. Yes, you're right. Absolutely. So the Shape of Water, because it has... It, it I've has been a- on planes a lot lately, and I've seen all of these movies. There you oh, go. yeah. <laughs> the two female protagonists, uh, Eliza and Zelda, uh, while they mostly talk about men, or in this case, a male sea creature, there is one exchange <laughs> between Zelda and another female co-worker, Yolanda, that allows the film to pass. It's Just one? W- there's this scene where they're, oh. where she's punching her card, and, and she's laying her cut in front of her and saying, hey, you can't cut in front of me. Um. me and leave me alone and I was keeping her place. I'll get you reported. You do that, Yolanda. You do that. So, so the there's grand... only one. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of sad. Yeah. But then also, so Grand Budapest Hotel did not pass? Exactly, because even Avatar though... Avatar did not pass? Uh, yes, because the Grand Budapest Hotel did not pass. Even though there are three supporting female characters named in it, none of them speak to one another in the film. Oh, my God. So, See, it's kind of a fun, it's a funny test though because yeah. some good movies some fail good, or have yeah. really feminist overtones. Yeah, but like say it say there's just one woman in the movie. Well, yeah, because it doesn't passing a Bechdel test doesn't mean that it's a it's feminist. No. Yeah, and that and Alison Bechdel's even said that too. No, it's exactly. Like, it, and not and failing it doesn't mean that it's not and and, and yeah. pass right. the test. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah and, it's just a funny sort of com- way to comparison and and, and think and, and think about, about it. Yeah, the so way women are. Portrayed. Yeah, I think she said it was like a yeah. more of like a cultural cultural barometer, you yeah. know. And the whole era of silent film, I mean, just they fails would, outright. They <laughs> wouldn't talk at all. Right. 
<laughs> I just had to thank, point that thanks out there. For, thanks for that deep, deep <laughs> observation. <laughs> Did you, was there more? There, there, more? there were more. Yeah. I mean, uh, we could do one. Let's, let's, do, let's do one let's more. Let's do one more. Okay. How, how about the Phantom one. Thread or the Artist? <laughs> the Artist is silent, right? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess they could still converse within the world of the they movie. Could, they could converse with their eyes. <laughs> with, I don't with know. words. I don't think there was two. And so it must be the other one. So not, not the Artist. I haven't seen either of these movies. I neither. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but the Phantom Thread is the correct answer. Oh. And it's about an obsessive dress designer, Reynolds, played by Daniel Day-Lewis, oh, who apparently right. retired after doing this film from acting. He said, oh. no more, he's done. I thought he did that before and became a cobbler. But now he's done for real. <laughs> a cobbler, like someone that cobbles? Yeah. Like a, a shoemaker? Shoe- yeah. <laughs> well, did you know, fun fact... <laughs> Daniel D. Lewis, he built, he learned to be a carpenter when he was hired to play John Proctor in the uh, movie version of The Crucible because he wanted to like be authentic. So he built this wow. house with no electricity because he wanted to be, see what it was like to live in the 1600s. Hmm. What a cool guy. Yeah. So in any case, yes, his last movie, See It While You Can. <laughs> so there's the two main women in the film his sister Cyril that's not a woman's name but I guess who am I to judge I've heard it both right. ways and his lover Alma live their lives according to Reynolds idiosyncrasies and they only speak to each other about him Alma has a brief conversation with Princess Mona Braganza the exchange Though seemingly prompted by Alma's desire to mark her claim on Reynolds, never mentions a man. So Alma says, Hmm. I want to wish you good fortune on your wedding. And Princess Mona says, thank you. And then Alma says, je m'appelle Alma. (laughs) And (laughs) Princess uh, Mona says, lovely to meet you, Alma. And then Alma says, I live here. Yeah, and that's I don't the think, conversation. I don't yeah. think that that passes. But well, I feel like that's a that. But yeah, well, cheat. I think part of what makes the Bechdel test work as a comic, and and what's kind of funny is is like how absurdly low the bar is to pass, right? right? Like that, right? It, okay. It's like an it's like an incredibly low bar. Does and, Fun Home pass? Yeah, she has conversations with her mom about, all the time about like uh, about, about, the, about the dad. No, about plays like they mm. they act out plays together and I guess if you if you think reciting lines no I think counts. and then there's some conversations okay I'm, I'm just trying like, to just remember I feel now. like yeah it's I think like, it does I can't remember specifically but I'm pretty sure I go- I googled it <laughs> just to does this one home pass the Bechdel test yes okay see I thought maybe That's I could blow your I mind by know. being all like it doesn't pass the test <laughs> her own test and just getting back to what you said Erica mm-hmm. about the artist uh, being a silent film. <laughs> They, they address that in here. They say that it is a silent film, but the characters do carry on conversations <laughs> yeah. with the occasional assist from a title card. But again, it's kind of like the Grand Budapest Hotel, where, where all the supporting female characters never talk to each other. Mm-hmm. So that's why it there fails. You go. She does eventually, um, in the book Fun Home, she does eventually tell her mother she got her period. So okay. there's so a that, conversation. That, 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 oh, thank okay. goodness. <laughs> there you go. Thank goodness for that I was period. Like, I was like flip, flip, flipping. I need, needed to find, I mean, of course. Well, yeah. she wouldn't. I am starting to get her own. Oh, do you do you have cramps or anything? No. Are you okay with pads? Maybe you can get me some more. Okay. Well, if you get cramps, tell me. Okay. But what, killer but, conversation. But what if period was code for her feelings <gasps> for her father? Oh. Well, she would have used n dot That's dot right. dot. Yes. Right. That That's was her right. code for menstruation yeah. in her book. Oh, yeah. right. In her in her book in yeah. her journal. In her book. Yeah. So I I had a question about the book. I was wondering if anyone related to Allison's character uh, oh, and yeah. if so what how did you relate to her in watching her go through her life mm. well I did <laughs> 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 well a couple of things really struck home for me one of them was her journal entries when she would start saying like I think or something like and some of the more obsessive compulsive parts of, of stuff when I when when I was younger and especially when I was going through periods where I was feeling very stressed or emotionally whatever I would have the I had these like coping mechanisms that were very similar and then the other one that that really got to me was when she goes home for her father's funeral and the first time she sees her brother, and they can't help smiling. Mm-hmm. And for me, it wasn't like it's it's you know in my in my experience, it wasn't because we were like happy that the person had passed away, but it was just this sort of weird reaction that I have sometimes to when things are really serious and outside of my normal life. But she had a great way of putting it. It's on page. 
46 and 47 of the paperback copy, where they greeted each other with ghastly, uncontrollable grins. And then it says, it could be argued that death is inherently absurd and that grinning is not necessarily an inappropriate response. Yeah. Yeah. And that totally, because I've never understood my, my I, I, I have to stop myself from giggling at wakes and stuff just because it's just, it's, it's such an odd thing they're there and then they're not they're there yeah. and then they're not and then you're all together and you're all like oh this is so so sad it isn't you know even if they were like really really old and they've been sick for a long time and i just i find myself wanting to make jokes to lighten the mood <laughs> and i have to be all like this is not appropriate but it's just my and then yeah and then this this weird smiling thing that other people in my family have too so we are so sort of all working so you all on sit there together. in the pews with big <laughs> smiles no, it's more like we smile when we see each other right. and we're like trying to i don't know it's the weirdest thing and maybe I, it's, 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 maybe not it's weird. the absurdity I, of I, the situation i laughed when i found out my dad died that was my first uh reaction because it's oh. ridiculous right because there's this element of like this yeah, is crazy yeah i didn't know my dad uh, well I, I met him a few times when i was really little and then like our family fell out of touch with them and then my mom wanted to talk to me one day and I was like okay tell me over the phone and she's like no I got to see you in person no. so she came to my apartment and and told me and I I, I laughed because it's so ups- I was like that's the end of that mystery that's right. all wow. where where he was yeah. and I find it kind of awkward telling people that because I want to joke about it and my close friends know that it's okay to laugh about but it becomes really awkward when I'm with some close friends and there's a newer friend in there and someone (laughs) drops a joke about my dead dad and the person just gets this like horrified look on their face like your friend's a your friend's a jerk for (laughs) for laughing about this yeah well humor can sometimes just be such a release in 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 awkward and difficult situations but I'm so glad you said that Erica because I am famous for saying inappropriate things at, fu- at funerals like I remember I, I was at my that. I was at my uncle's graveside service and my aunt came up to me and said I'm so glad you're here and I said I'm so happy to be here <laughs> Yeah, you, you know, which it was not exactly what I meant because meant, I was I not. I wouldn't be anywhere else, of course. Uh, I'm yeah, there was a million things I could have said, <laughs> except that I am happy that my uncle, who I like, is dead and there. So we're all here and, now, and that's only one of several, several times where I've. So now. I, when I go to funerals, I don't say anything. Uh, yeah. I can't. I can't console the bereaved. Uh, I just. I just make a beeline to the snack table. Yeah, it's, it's best but, if I stay near the snacks. One, and I don't one, one time. One time, I was at the uh, a funeral, and I was standing next to the refreshments table, and I was actually asked by the funeral director to step away because the family should go through first. Oh, and I was indignant because I was not uh, staking out a spot. I just happened to be standing in the room, and oh look, there's the table. Like I was. Uh-huh. Like, I honestly was not I was so like I was like well that, you can keep your stupid food at that point and I, <laughs> but and I'm still I, gonna stand right here yeah so I didn't so I moved away and then and then actually Marla my wife was had gone to the washroom and she came back and she saw, she saw me having this altercation with the funeral director and <laughs> oh, no. and so she had to we had to leave and then we had to hit a drive through on the way home <laughs> Uh, no. So yeah. So you were trying not to get into trouble, and you got into bigger trouble. Exactly. I was trying to have a respectful distance away because I knew I was going to say something stupid, and instead it looked like I was trying to get. To and those then you fancy still got sandwiches. taken to McDonald's. Yeah, like a little treat. That's well, true. You still got a treat. So. I did have a treat at the end of it all, which was nice. <laughs> Thanks, Marla. <laughs> Thanks, Marla. <laughs> That's an awesome story. Can we talk about her relationship with her dad? Like that complicated yeah. relationship of, I mean, you'd sort of think that, you know, her being gay and him being gay, like maybe she would somehow feel more comfortable to talk to him. I mean, I think that there's a obviously a generational thing. and Yeah, it's, if- it's interesting because there's the theme of guilt that she feels because she, part of her believes that her coming out yeah. is what caused her dad to uh, commit suicide. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's, the, that's the garbage. Yeah. Like, that's just garbage. <laughs> like, like <laughs> I don't think that, that if, he, if he committed suicide... I don't think it was her coming out that would have done it. I, you know, he has so many other problems. More than anything, it's going to be the fact that his wife filed for divorce and this beautiful facade of a life that he was so obsessed over is going to be falling down. It's it's not the gay daughter. Yes, I, I agree that that's probably the well, case. And but perhaps sh- the fact that he lived closeted for... 
Yeah. 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 Forever. But, uh, yeah. A, a contributing factor. Maybe not the final straw, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. but she's but she still has to deal with those emotions. Yeah. And that's yeah. the tricky part about yeah. being a human being, right? It's right. like you have this to deal poor with the kid, right? Like she didn't have no guilt at all about anything <laughs> that she's done. It seems like she's done better than ninety nine percent of people who yeah. would be put in that situation. And I just want to note the main problem with the dad is not that he's gay and closeted. He also preyed on yeah. teenage yes, boys. Right. Sure. Yep. That, so, which kind of ticks me off because there's this whole thing about like gay people being deviants and stuff like this. And in his case, it was true. And I, I just, oh, that just bothered me so much. It, it kind of bothered me in the sense that it really glossed over that aspect in the book. Yeah, and they, I guess partially because she wasn't she wouldn't have part of lived that, that part, right? No, knowledge yeah. Of that. no yeah, she, she would have just yeah heard that he bought uh, beer for somebody and got in trouble for yeah. Had but to go, but had in to go writing to the book, it's it's very yeah. clear. So at some point, right. you know, yeah. going back, it's she, probably she a, con- a conscious this. choice not to deal with it because she puts herself in every other character. So she didn't put herself in the character of his victims, if you want to call them victims, or yeah, you know. But she also doesn't talk about her own reactions to that and well i mean she maybe a little bit but not not a not lot in really, terms of no. in terms of how finding out about that made her feel maybe about her own sexuality and and stuff like that or, or about, even in terms of letting the dad off uh, off the hook you know like, oh you know what she does she says something like oh you know like we could i could say that it's about like the homophobia and stuff mm-hmm. making him whatever but it doesn't excuse what he did or something like that and Yeah, I think if I'm remembering right, there was a part about that. (laughs) Winnipeg Public Library is pleased to announce the opening of the Idea Mill, the new makerspace on the third floor of the Millennium Library. The Idea Mill is a place where you can use tools, equipment, and software to create things both virtual and physical. Come in and have your 3D designs printed on our 3D printers. Book some time in the sound booths and record yourself singing, reciting oral history, or playing an instrument. You can book a sewing machine, a soldering iron, a green screen lighting kit, or a MIDI keyboard. Have some old LPs or cassettes you want to preserve? Use our digital conversion equipment to turn them into MP3s. Use our computers to work with Adobe Creative Suite and other creative software so you can edit your photos, movies, or audio recordings. Visit us on the web at winnipeg.ca slash ideamill. Or better yet, come and visit us on the third floor of the Millennium Library. Our grand opening is Tuesday, July 10th at 11 a.m. We're looking forward to seeing what you create. Does anyone uh, have a book that they think that they would also like? Oh. Or is that too soon? No, that that is a perfect time to segue into, can you tell me a book you would also like? Mine was mainly because I was reading at the same time as this, and there's so many allusions to Greek uh, li- literature in, in some of this with Daedalus and Odysseus and all of them. Is I was reading Circe by Madeline Miller, and that's her new book. She wrote also wrote Song of Achilles, which is one of my favorite books of all time about Patroclus and his relationship with Achilles during the Trojan War and how he was um, the best part of Achilles. He was kind of like a petulant hero. Anyway, Circe is about uh, d- the daughter of a titan who is sort of a lesser goddess and doesn't fit in amongst the other gods and is eventually banished to an isle and kind of lives through the centuries there. And so she crosses paths with a lot of these great characters, Odysseus and Daedalus, and she goes to Crete to help deliver the Minotaur when it's born and all these stuff. And so it's sort of talking about troublesome women, women who don't fit in. Circe tries to make her own way through the decades on her own up against these like up against the battle between the Titans and the Olympians and all of these like various forces trying to crush her and she just tries to outsmart them. It's an amazing book if you like myth because you'll recognize so many characters but it's also an amazing book if you don't know anything about Greek myth because it's just about these themes of power and trying to be trying to dictate your own fate instead of leaving it up to other people. So that's um, Circe by Madeline Miller. And would it pass the Bechdel test? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sounds like it would. She talks about fate and, yeah, fate and the gods and, yeah. Really I good. love Greek mythology. I and love takes Greek on mythology. It. Well, yeah. the, the book I picked, it was uh, by a local author named Susan Riley. 
and the book was called We Watch the Waves. And uh, the reason I picked it, it's it's tie into Fun Home, is that it also is a memoir that she has written about her father who died and whose death may or may not have been a suicide Mm. and her father who may or may not have been uh, gay. And she's from Winnipeg and recreates her parents' young life through letters to, from, to and from each other. So if you enjoy, like as you talked earlier, reading letters, you might like this one. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and the, another thing that's kind of interesting is she grew up in the same neighborhood that I live in now on a street just a few streets away. So like a weirdo, I went over and checked out the house when I read this because uh, I just thought it would be kind of cool to see because it's, it's this old house on an old street. And uh, it's called We Watch the Waves uh, because that was her father's squadron slogan when he was in the war in uh, mm-hmm. in, ni- in uh, World War II. So right. that would be my Super pick. local. Super local. That's awesome. I actually just like changed my my. Oh, book. I don't think that's like, allowed. Like, like no, totally, like on the fly, like right when you were talking. You could do two. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, well, I have a second one. I down. have two. Oh, <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. So we'll just do a what? Do one. Okay. So my book now is Curtains: Adventures mm. of an Undertaker in Training by Tom Juck. Jokinen, Jokinen, and uh, it's basically... Maybe it would be a good idea to uh, look up the pronunciation <laughs> uh, on this last minute uh, switcheroo. J-O-K-I-N-E-N. Mm-hmm. So this writer, Tom... It, You're just non- making this up right it's now. It's nonfiction. <laughs> it's nonfiction. And he, he decides to, to quit his job as a writer, and he becomes an apprentice undertaker here in Winnipeg. And so he explores the inner workings of a funeral home and how what you need to do to be an undertaker. And there's lots of references reference to local funeral homes and some of it is quite funny as well but then he also talks about kind of the business that is the undertaking business and the and the funeral home business and how it can be quite terrible Mm -hmm. um and sort of preying upon people who have lost their especially husbands so you know older older women who don't have a lot of money anyway it's a very good book actually in this little description that i just pulled up on my phone right now it said (laughs) if bill bryson were to apprentice at a funeral home searching for the meaning of life and death you'd have curtains which oh man i'm sold (laughs) bill bryson come on (laughs) So yeah, so that is my that is my book, nice. uh, Curtains by Tom Juckinen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have two books, and they're 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 sort of related. Um, and so in in Fun Home, Bechdel talks about uh, Camus' happy death, which I thought was interesting because looking into that, Camus decided to not publish that book, and it was only published about ten years after his death. And I thought it was interesting that Bechdel didn't mention that fact mm. in the book because it seems like the fact that she would it would be something that she would would bring up. But Wikipedia states that a happy death is a precursor to Camus' most famous work, The Stranger, which is the book that I'm recommending. Both characters are named Mersault, and I haven't read Happy Death, but I'm wondering if The Stranger is more of like a radical revision on the existential topics that Camus wanted to discuss, rather than a sort of sequel to A Happy Death that uh, that Wikipedia seems to imply. Hmm. But speaking of existentialism, uh, I'm going to talk to you about one of the greatest mysteries in my life that I, mm. that I haven't been able to solve. Is uh, so there's a play in French called Le Jeu Sans Fait, pardon my pronunciation, uh, by Jean-Paul Sartre, which is apparently a very, like, it's a famous play in the French uh, world. A lot of my friends who went to high school in French have read this play, but an English translation doesn't really exist for this play, and I'm not sure why. Because his other plays, like No Exit, is is a very, very famous play, but this book doesn't have an English translation of the play. There is, from the 19... 40s, a translation novelization where they took the play and they made it into a novel, but that has been out of print for a long, long time and currently runs between $50 and $60 on Amazon. Uh, 
I did read it because I got it through a wonderful interlibrary loan service <laughs> at the library. interlibrary loan. <laughs> Plug there. And I got U of M's copy. And it's such an interesting story. It's about two lovers who die during the German occupation of France. And they meet each other in, I'm sorry, they're not lovers when they die, but they meet each other in purgatory and they discover that they're soulmates. So they're given a second chance at life on earth, but only if they can prove their love for each other within 24 hours. Otherwise, it's their second chance at life. That sounds will amazing. Be Why is that not translated? I know, right? It's, oh my it's, story gosh. I've ever heard. It's, it's such a good story, so much so that I checked. Because it would be made into a movie right away, probably. <laughs> yeah. That's why it hasn't yeah. been. I check the holdings at U of M every few years just to make sure that that book is there. Yeah, yeah. And, and it is still there, but currently it's under a sign in to view policy, which makes me oh. think that now it's not being lent out anymore. That doesn't mean we couldn't possibly, <laughs> we couldn't get it through interlibrary loan, but I'm not 100% mm. sure. So you lucky folks out there who speak French, we do have Le Jeux Enfin in our collection. So if you can read French, you can check out the story. And if you find a copy of the translation cheap at a bookstore, buy it because it's worth something. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, Alan, when the uh, when the interlibrary loan came in and you saw it was from the U of M, did you feel a little let down? Like, were you, were you hoping it was going to be from a little more exotic <laughs> library? You know, like, U of M, so that's, like a cro- that's a cross town. You know, like... <laughs> I yeah I, w- I was a little disappointed, <laughs> but uh, yeah you never know where it's going to come from. Exactly, that's what that's what the interlibrary loan slogan should be. You never know, you never know where it's going to come from. Come from. Yeah. Interlibrary loan. Interlibrary loan. WPL. Oh. So before we give up on fun home, do we just have any final words? Like dislike? Read it. Kirsten said she'd read it again. I'm totally going to read it. Again. I've read it twice. I think I would definitely pull things out reading it a third time. Yeah, I would I would read it again, and I I want to apologize that we didn't really have time to talk about a lot of the themes in the book. Yeah, because there's so much in there that yeah we 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 need a bunch more time to do it. Yeah. So yeah, and I didn't realize until uh, I can't remember who said that there was a follow up book that focuses on uh, her mother. So I'd yeah, be, that would have come in the bio. Oh, the bio. The I thought it was, yeah. but for some reason I thought Alan said that. I thought that's weird. Alan wouldn't have said that. What is it? Are yeah. you my mother? Or yes. Are you? Yeah, yeah. I'm totally so going to read that. I'm, I'm yeah. interested in, in, yeah. in reading that. As well, just yeah, keep, I will be mum on that topic then. <laughs> mum, no. <laughs> <Very good> puns, <laughs> and that's a word nerd, nerd word nerd thing to do words for word nerds. <laughs> Thank you for the segue, You're Erica, welcome. bringing us into that special time of the show where each of our hosts pick a word, defines it, and then explains why it's been tickling their tongue for the past month. So my word is rumination and um, the verb to ruminate. So rumination has two definitions. One is sort of to think over and one is to actually like for, for a cow, say, to chew its cud over and over and over. And I, I, I thought about looking this up because of the fact that, that, ru- that ruminant animals are called what they are. It's just cows and deers and all these other things that chew cud when they have nothing else to do to, to help digest their stuff. So I wanted to look it up and it, yeah it is it is actually from the same root so the figurative uh, ruminating so this is from i think it's dictionary.com it might be merriam webster i'll put it in the show notes anyway so figurative ruminating is a kind of deep thought that is often deemed worthy of activity the verb ruminate has described metaphorical chewing over since the 1500s and actual chewing since the early 1600s so first it was the metaphorical chewing our english word derives from and shares the meanings of the latin ruminari which which I love because it sounds like Illuminati or some yeah, sort of I, like I was, secret mm, society. Totally, totally. Secret uh, handshakes. <laughs> which in turn derives from rumen, the Latin name for the first stomach compartment of ruminant animals, creatures like cows that chew their cuts. So it actually seems to come from the name for the stomach of these animals and then became the metaphoric chewing over and then became the actual chewing over. So mm-hmm. the other reason that I like this is because it comes up a lot in discussions about positive thinking and mindfulness because rumination in psychology is when you just gets stuck going over the same thing over and over and over again with no solution. So in psychology, it's the focused attention on the symptoms of one's distress and its possible causes and consequences as opposed to solutions. So both rumination and worry are associated with anxiety and other emotional states. So one of the things you can do is realize you're ruminating and either distract yourself or start coming up with solutions to the thing that you're 
going over and over and over and over and over in your brain. So the word of the month for me is rumination, and the visual is of a cow. A cow, yeah. <laughs> Chewing. Chewing that cud. <laughs> Which makes me happy. Wow. There you go. <laughs> well, in my word, you can chew on this. And, uh, <laughs> wait a second. Um, because we were talking about the Bechdel test, I was thinking of another test, a famous test called the Turing test. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was developed by Alan Turing in 1950. And it, it was a test to determine whether a machine was able to exhibit intelligent behavior. Like, could a machine think? Could a computer think? And I'm not going to read the entire Wikipedia article on it because it's 25 pages is long. <laughs> but just to give you a, a little bit of a uh, flavor of it, uh, there apparently are three different versions of the test, but the one that is talked about m- most of the time is called The Imitation Game, which was also made into a movie not that long Quite ago. Quite a good movie. Benedict Cumber, Cumberbatch. Excuse me. Pardon me. Benedict, Benedict Cumberbatch. Cumberbatch. Get his name right. Yes, I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I tripped over that. <laughs> uh, plays Alan Turing in that. And so the uh, the idea is like a simple party game involving three players. You have pl- a a, B, and C. So A is a man, B is a woman, and C can uh, be either sex or I suppose gender at this point. Yeah, I have a gender. Is the role of the interrogator. So in the imitation game, player C is unable to see player A or B. They can only communicate through written notes. And when the uh, interrogator, player C, asks questions of player A, player A tries to trick the interrogator into making the wrong choice, whether which one is the man and which one is the woman. Player B B, the woman, tries to assist the interrogator. And so what Turing uh, tests is if you substitute the, the man's uh, role, player A, with a computer, would the interrogator know the difference? Uh, mm-hmm. In the type of questions they're asked, could, could the computer learn to try to trick the interrogator. And, mm-hmm. and that's sort of it in a nutshell. I'm sure it's way more complicated <laughs> than that. But anyone that's a fan of the movie Blade Runner will remember that there's a, a test they do called the Void Comp Test, where uh, Harrison Ford uh, reads a bunch of scenarios to, I guess, is it Harrison Ford that reads it? No, it's, it, it appears a couple times in the movie where they try to determine whether someone's a replicant or a human. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that idea of the Void Comp Test is based on the Turing test. So Ooh. Turing They test. have a comp test every year where computer program- programmers get together and try and beat the Turing test and they get closer and closer every year but there are a few more caveats um, and there's also a great podcast episode Radio Lab does an episode on the Turing test that's really interesting great. so that's my nerd word Good. So speaking of um, podcasts that bring up good words, <laughs> Radio Lab did something on the Turing test. Segway. Okay. So I was um, on a plane recently and I was listening to the Stuff You Missed in History podcast. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to get my dad into podcasts. So uh, yeah, we've been <laughs> <laughs> introducing this one to him. So um, I was listening to a podcast about uh, defenestration of Prague. Defenestration is from the Latin and French meaning out the window. The word first appeared in English in the 1600s after what was known as the Second Defenestration of Prague, in which a group of Protestant Bohemian protesters threw two Catholic imperial officials and their secretary out a window at the Prague Castle, thus helping start the Thirty Years' War. That was the second defenestration. There was actually a first one that happened 200 years earlier when seven town officials were thrown from the window of the Prague Town Hall and started the Hussite War. But they didn't all die because I think some of them fell in horse manure, which was then, of course, seen as divine intervention. But that's a whole other story. But the the word only really caught on with the English after that second defenestration. So in the 1600s. Prague sounds dangerous. There was actually three (laughs) defenestrations in all. The third one happened in like 1940 when the last non-communist member of parliament was thrown out the window or perhaps is this just like something they do like when they're really really mad they throw people out the window or is it just sort of well it happened those three times it's a local thing it's happened those three times so I mean and and it was all political dissent right so that that now when we use the word and it actually comes up I had actually never heard heard the word before. I love that word. Or I maybe had read it and I just didn't really know what it meant. So I just uh, No, I've never heard it until this very moment. <laughs> Thank you. Good. I'm glad. Um, anyway, but now you can actually, you will notice it more and more, I think, in articles right now, in news articles, like there was a, Theresa May was perilously close to defenestration. <laughs> um, or the strange slow motion defen- 
demonstration of Jeff Sessions. So I think you're going to see it more and more and more. All these, yeah. So keep an eye out for it. That's right. I'm just glad the Carol Shields room does not have windows. It's (laughs) impossible to defenestrate somebody from here. But also, stuff you missed in history podcasts, very interesting. Very good. Can I just say that the best defenestration, I can't say it. Can you say it again? Defenestration. Defenestration is it takes place in the movie Action Jackson. Was it self defenestration? No. no, He, uh, he's fighting, he's fighting somebody and he throws him out the window and the guy gets thrown across an alley through another window. Whoa. Into another building. So that is, well, I guess it's not technically a defenestration. It's then not, not at all. It's like briefly a defenestration and then a A (laughs) re-fenestration. And did it start any wars? Right afterwards. No, <laughs> but there was a car that drove into a house and up the steps. There's, so that's the best movie. There's also, I can't remember if this is true or not, but there's the story of the person who's trying to commit suicide and jumps out the window. Meanwhile, a few floors down, a husband and wife are arguing and the husband fires off a shot from his gun, which goes out the window, kills the guy as he's, as falling. he's falling. And so the the man gets charged for murder. For murder. Oh. So, please mm. believe it or not. <laughs> I think we have to do like a whole podcast on like nerd words. <laughs> it is fine. So much to talk about. Uh, so my my nerd word, uh, I think is inherently hilarious as a word. It's Drake. <laughs> I Which, like that you found that funny. I, know. <laughs> like, I don't think it's a funny, but I laughed because you think it's funny. I know, I'm just laughing because everyone else is laughing. <laughs> <laughs> it only gets funnier from here. Because <laughs> the top definition is is a male duck, which is... <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> He's feeling all awkward, it's like at a funeral cause he, cause or something. Because you yeah. thought all ducks were ladies. <laughs> a male duck. <laughs> that's impossible. That's not, that doesn't happen in nature. And that's the that's the only definition that, that Webster lists. Uh, Dictionary.com has a, a second definition with three parts. The first being a small cannon used especially in the 17th and 18th yep. centuries. Also hilarious. No. It <laughs> <laughs> uh, only works once. Uh, uh, a Drake fly, uh, which I didn't look up to see if it looked funny, but I can imagine so by the name. Hilarious. Uh, and the third is, it's an archaic use for a dragon, the term Drake. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which yeah, is, yeah. Which, yeah. which is, I was surprised to find that listed as archaic because I, I grew up reading a lot of fantasy and in fantasy there are often Drakes. Usually they're like smaller subspecies of dragons not a dragon proper. Or as a name, like you, you or know, as like a name, the, yes. Draco Malfoy was. Whoa, that's yes. right. That was uh, yeah, really that was what she related. was going for. Yeah. The next set of definitions are coming from Urban Dictionary, uh, which is always good <laughs> for most, a laugh. Re- the most reliable. This is, this is the, 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 the adult. This is the adult portion of the uh, uh, podcast. But uh, I, I've definitely done some editing uh, to these, <laughs> <Next> <laughs> so proceed to Urban Dictionary with caution. <laughs> but the dr- name Drake is often referred to the video game Uncharted, one of the greatest vi- games ever, uh, in which you're a young fortune teller. I think the person who made this definition meant to say fortune hunter, uh, but fortune <laughs> <teller>. <laughs> uh, by the name of Nathan Drake, uh, who goes on many adventures and finds lost treasure, similar to Indiana Jones. The library has several of these video games in its collection, just so you know. Drake is also a Canadian rapper who is an example of how going mainstream can ruin a rapper. <laughs> <laughs> People, <laughs> he was an actor before he was a rapper. <laughs> you ru- yeah. you're ruining Grassy. my punchline, oh, oh, Trevor. Oh, 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 we'll edit it out. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, that's, that's it's all good. Uh, people, who, people say he sucks haven't listened to some of his music from before 09. I'm not saying I'm a hardcore fan, but listen to So Far Gone. The next definition is Drake or Dizzy is a Canadian hip-hop artist from Canada, not to be confused with the Australian hip-hop artist Driz Kid from Australia. Drake went to high school at Degrassi Junior High where he was, and I had to edit this out for content. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So you can go check that out online. But the reason it's my nerd word is that earlier this month Drake released his music video for I'm Upset, which featured a complete Degrassi The Next Generation reunion. So they had oh, all the so actors cool. from Degrassi TNG, um, <laughs> which is amazing because I had thought he had, you know, abandoned them and uh, went on to become super famous. But no, he went back. He remembered uh, his roots. Remembered where he came from. 
so yeah, so I'm up. I'm upside is a hip hop song that features a trap production and rolling hi hats, deep bass, and a subdued piano loop with Drake ra- rapping lines such as "I'm upset, fifty thousand on my head, it's disrespect." <laughs> Drake also references needing to pay a woman's bills every month and get her what she want. The song was also noted as containing an emo influence. Mm. And that's why Drake, Drake makes you, makes you Hilarious. laugh. Hilarious. 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 <laughs> Let's just go back to the image of the duck that made us all laugh before. Uh, Out the window. <laughs> Defenestrated duck. But, uh, but I was a huge fan of Degrassi, The Next Generation, yeah. and I only got into it because I heard Kevin Smith directed a few episodes mm. and brought Jane Silent Bob. So I, I follow Kevin Smith anywhere including in, <laughs> into Degrassi, the next generation <laughs> so uh thank you so much dear readers for joining us on this voyage of the time to read podcast we hope you enjoyed it as much as we have next month we will be reading son of a trickster by eden robinson find it at your local winnipeg public library branch and join our discussion on our website at wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca or by emailing us at wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca remember to rate us on itunes five stars and and until next time, make sure you find Time to Read. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Time to Read. We were discussing Fun Home by Alison Bechdel. Time to Read is a production of the Winnipeg Public Library. Your hosts today were Alan Chorney, Kirsten Werman, Erica Ball, and Trevor Lockhart. Our webmaster is Aaron Seaburn. Our social media guru is Regan Brew. Audio production and music by Dennis Penner. We want you to be part of the show, too. Email us at wpl-podcast at winnipeg.ca with suggestions for books that you'd like us to read and discuss, and comments and questions about the book we're reading for our next show. Visit us on the web at wpl-podcast.winnipeg.ca. Check out our show notes with links to some of the things we talked about today, and take part in a discussion about the books we're reading. Next month, we're reading Son of a Trickster by Eden Robinson. We're looking forward to hearing what you think.